I want to start with a question. It might be a little bit of a loaded question. It's a rhetorical question, but it's simply this. Are you rich? Now, probably most of us, if we think, am I rich? We think no. And the reason that we think no is because we always know somebody that's more rich than we are. Probably you're not on the top 10 richest people in the world list. And so no matter how much you make, you think to yourself, well, I'm not really rich because Elon Musk makes way more money than I have. I'm not, I can buy Twitter on a whim rich and therefore I'm, I'm still relatively poor. In a recent survey that was done by CNBC, here's what they discovered. When asked how much money they need to earn annually in order to feel rich, the majority of Americans said at least $200,000. Now, here was what was so interesting in that same study. They went on to say this in the same article, how much money you bring in right now, however, appears most likely to change your perception of how much it will take to feel wealthy. When they were interviewing people that made less than $50,000 and they said, how much do you need to feel rich? They said $100,000. But when they interviewed people that were making $100,000, how much they needed to feel rich? They said $150,000. But when they were interviewing those people, they said $200,000. But guess what? Even though most Americans would say if they make $200,000 a year, they feel rich. When they interviewed those Americans that make $200,000 a year, they did not feel rich. They said, I just need to make this much more and then I will feel rich. And that's part of the problem. That being rich is all about perception. Uh, let's look at some data that's pulled from World Data. It's a fascinating website. That's where everybody kind of pulls their data. The average household income in the United States of America is $65,297. This is how that compared to the rest of the world. That around the world, the average household income is only $12,609. That's household income for an entire year. The average country other than the United States of America, 12,000, a little over $12,000. Hey, here's some specific countries if you wanna look at them. So Mexico, average household income is 20,944. China, average household income, 16,829. India drops down to a little under 7,000. Uh, Honduras is uh, under 6,000. Nepal, Haiti is only 3,034. All the way down to Uganda is 2,284. Uh, I chose these countries specifically because our church works with some of these different countries. There's different missions agencies that we have connections with in some of these countries. Uh, not long ago, an economist wrote a book about uh, the 1% and what it means to be in the 1%. And if you have an annual income of over $34,400, as an individual, that average income would put you in the top 1% of the entire world. Uh, to put it in perspective, 9.2% of the world, that's 725 million people in the world, they live on less than $2 a day. The good part about that number is that that percentage has gone way down. 30 years ago, it was closer to 30% of the world lived on, uh, it's considered extreme poverty, less than two dollars a day. Now it's only down to 9.2%. And so now let's go back to that original question. Are you rich? It's a matter of perspective, isn't it? Why do we not feel rich when in a global world, a global economy, we really are rich? rich. Here's a reality that our tendency in life is to focus on what we are missing instead of what we have. We know someone that's got more stuff. We know someone that has more things than us. And so we focus on those things and we convince ourselves, well, I, I don't have enough money to give because I'm not rich. There are other people that have more things than I have. We always look up and compare ourselves that direction. We rarely look down and compare ourselves the other direction. Jesus talks about money a lot. He talks about money more than he talks about the subject of heaven. Now, when a pastor preaches on heaven, nobody ever walks out and says, man, pastor's preaching on heaven again. I can't believe it. 
But there's this sensitivity when it comes to money that when we preach on money and talk about money, we walk out and we have that mindset. You see, in the Bible, there's a lot of scripture about money. And here's two truths that you see as an overarching thing inside the Bible. That number one, money is not evil. Money is not bad. Money is a good thing. But the use of money and the love of money can be evil and can be bad and can be a very destructive thing. If you've got your Bible, turn with me to Luke. We're gonna be in chapter 12. We're gonna start in verse 13. And we're gonna look at two different sections. And most of the time, here's what we do. We break them up into two different conversations, two different passages, but they're really all one conversation. And so we're gonna start with a parable and then we're gonna go into Jesus's further teaching on money. It says this, someone in the crowd said to him, him being Jesus, teacher, Tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Now pause for a second because there's some cultural context that we got to understand. In the first century, that inheritance went to the firstborn son, period. End of story. So if you were a secondborn son, you didn't get the inheritance. The firstborn son didn't. And then that firstborn son could determine how much he wanted to give you. If you were a daughter, even if you were the firstborn daughter and the oldest, if you were a daughter, you technically could receive no inheritance. And so this is a real genuine issue that exists in the first century. A brother says, my older brother has the inheritance and he's not giving me any of it. I'm gonna be destitute. Jesus, teacher, rabbi, tell my brother to divide it with me. But he said to him, Jesus' response, man, who made me a judge or arbiter over you? Jesus is like, hey, why, why, are you, why are you asking me? And he said to them, take care and be on your guard against all covetousness. Now, if you're someone that underlines, this is such a powerful message. Jesus says, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Man, that's, that's hard to really grasp and understand, but one's life does not consist of the abundance of his possessions. And he told them a parable saying the land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build the larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and all of my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Now, now pause for a second, because here's what's interesting in that parable. He gets asked this question, a very tangible question of my brother has the inheritance, tell him to give me some of the inheritance. Then Jesus never actually gives an answer to that question. He instead gives this parable. This is what Jesus does masterfully so often is he has this issue and instead of solving the issue, he really just kind of muddies the water a little bit because he doesn't tell us that, well, this parable is for your older brother. Have him pay attention. Or he doesn't say, well, this parable is actually for you, the brother who wants the inheritance, pay attention. He says, no, this parable is for all of us to understand something. Then in the same conversation, he continues. Now, this part that says, do not be anxious, that, that's just the title of this section. If you're looking through scripture and it's got different titles, that's not actually in the original Greek. That's not part of the text. We just break it up with different sections to help us understand. And so this section, we often teach as a separate section than that one before, but you can tell it's the same conversation. So on the heels of giving this parable about this man who's trying to store everything up and Jesus says, hey, you can't take it with you. You're, he died immediately and all that he had stored up was a waste for him. In the same conversation, the same breath, it says, and he said to his disciples, this isn't just the 12, this is all of his followers, all the, the crowd that's been following him. He says, therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. What you will eat, nor about your body, what you will put on for life is more than food and the body more than clothing. 
Consider the ravens, they neither sow nor reap. They, neither, they have neither storehouse nor barn, and yet God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his lifespan? If then you are not able to do as small a thing as that, why are you anxious about the rest? Anxiety is such an easy trap to fall into. Now, I've known people that were anxious about getting sick or anxious about dying. And you can worry and worry and worry and worry about those things, but your worrying accomplishes nothing. It's actually the opposite. That science now shows us that stress and anxiety can actually be harmful for our health. So that thing that you're stressing about, sickness or death, by being anxious about it, by worrying about it, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. You're more likely to experience exactly that. We know this intellectually, and yet Jesus is pushing on it because it's a hard truth to wrestle with and grasp. Then he goes on, he says, consider the lilies, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass, which is alive in the field today and tomorrow, is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? And do not seek what you are to eat and what you are to drink, nor be worried, for all the nations of the world seek after these things, and your Father knows that you need them. Instead, seek his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. Now, it's interesting what he does here because over and over what Jesus does is he paints this picture of two different kingdoms. He says, there's the kingdom of this world that you currently live in, the culture that you're a part of, the people around you. And he says, but my kingdom is different than that. The kingdom that you live in lives in a kingdom that is worried and obsessed with stuff and things and possessions. And he said, but I want you to live in a kingdom that my kingdom that I'm ushering in is a lifestyle that is radically different than that. Instead of worrying about these things, I want you to seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first the kingdom of God and these things will be added, they will be secondary. Now, now here's one of the tensions so far in the text, is that Jesus is saying, hey, look at the birds, look at the lilies, look at the grass. God has provided in abundance to take care of them, and therefore God has provided in abundance to take care of you. But if we look around at the world around us, we say, but that's not true. I see people that are poor, that don't look like they're taken care of, that they don't have as many things as the crows or the lilies or the grass. It creates a challenge. And maybe you're thinking, well, did Jesus not know that? But Jesus grew up in the first century, a Jew under Roman occupation. It means that really the Jews as a whole were incredibly poor. Most of their money went to taxes to the Roman government. They also gave a tithe to the temple. There was not abundance. Jesus himself grew up in Galilee. He was from Nazareth. We know from historical documents along with the rest of the New Testament that the particular part of the poor region that Jesus came from was even poor for that region. His father was a tecton. That means he was a day laborer, possibly a carpenter. He also could have been a stonemason. Jesus himself became the same thing, a day laborer. So Jesus grew up in a very poor household in a very poor region as part of a very poor nation. That surely there were times growing up that Jesus was hungry and wanted more food than he had. And yet Jesus says, hey, do not worry. God's got it. It doesn't seem to make sense until we see what he says next. He says, fear not little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old. It's this picture of money bags or, or belts of money is one translation of it. It's a kind of an odd Greek word because we don't have the exact same thing. 
but it's your bank account, it's your wallet, it's your purse, it's wherever you keep your earthly possessions. He's saying by, by giving to the needy, by selling your possessions, he's saying you are therefore providing yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. And then he says, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And Jesus is trying to say, look, the heavenly father has created a world of abundance with enough for everybody. And he's saying, if you see people in need that don't have that abundance, it's not because our heavenly father hasn't provided, it's because that abundance has not been distributed. It's not been shared. So he said, if you are my follower and you're sitting in that position of abundance then you need to, with heavenly eyes, be looking at the world around you, finding those in need, finding those who are suffering and sharing with what you have. He's saying by sharing your material possessions on this earth, you are glorifying your God in heaven, uh, that you are advancing the kingdom of God, that you are investing into an eternal kingdom that's more important than a material one. Then he has that very challenging phrase, where your money is, where your treasure is, that is where your heart is. He's saying if your treasure, your money is being used for kingdom things, then kingdom things is where your heart is. If it's not, then there's a question. He's saying what we all know to be true. It's easy to say that you love something, but what really determines whether you love it or not is your checkbook. Without knowing anything about you, if I got your ledger, if I got your bank account, if I got your credit card statement, and just started flipping through and looking at where you're spending your money, that tells me what you value the most in your life. It was true 2,000 years ago, it's true today. Where your treasure is, that's where your heart is also. You see, we are born into this world in a way that is selfish. That's just the way that we're born. If you have kids, you know this. If you've ever had kids, if you've ever worked with kids, if you've ever been a child or seen a child, you know that kids are inherently selfish. I've never met a parent that said, I don't ever have to teach my kid to share. They just do it naturally out of the abundance and goodness of their heart. And my son, Brant, he's 10. I remember when he was somewhere around three, uh, almost four years old, we were out at my parents' house. Uh, they lived out in the country. And right next to their house, there were these woods where my dad had, had carved a trail. And so we got there and he wanted to immediately go on the trail. And as we started going out towards the trail, he saw this green tractor. Uh, my dad had bought this kind of antique green ride along John Deere tractor. So it, you could technically get on it and it had pedals for a kid to, to pedal and it would move, except it was all sandy and, and a bunch of dirt. And so a, none of our kids were strong enough to pedal. So we took a, a, a big yellow rope and we harnessed it around. And what would happen is he would get on the tractor and I would drag him around and I would just kind of walk and walk and walk and he'd feel like he's a little farmer and he thought it was the coolest thing in the world. And so he wants to go out on the trails. He immediately jumps onto the tractor. I grab the rope. I start dragging him and dragging him. I feel like an ox. I'm just dragging him. And then about two minutes into the trails, he hops off, starts running around, we're on the trails for another 30 minutes. The whole time I'm dragging the green tractor. The whole time I'm like, hey, you wanna get back on? Cause I'm already dragging this thing. Might as well get on there, might as well enjoy it. Whole time he's like, no, I'm good. No, I don't want to, no, I want, don't want to. We finally get back around to the house. And as we get back around to the house, uh, my brother shows up, see his car show up. My nephew, who's almost the exact same age as my son, he jumps out of the car. He sees the tractor and he starts running straight for the tractor. Brant's kind of oblivious at first. And all of a sudden he looks up, he sees his cousin. He sees his cousin's eyes on the green tractor. And Brant immediately, when he's about 10 feet from the tractor, Brant jumps on, so on top of the tractor. And he's like, no, 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 I am on the tractor. And I'm looking at him like 30 minutes. I've been dragging this thing around and you did not want to be on the tractor. And now that he sees the tractor, you want on the tractor. And so I take Brant up, Shep's already crying. So I take Brant up, I pull him over here. 
I get down, knee on my knee, eye to eye, have a heart to heart. I say, Brandt, you had all the opportunity to use it and you chose not to use it. The only reason you're wanting it now is because your cousin wants it. We gotta share. We gotta be good with the things that we have and share with people so that you both have a turn. There's plenty of tractor riding to be had by both of you. And he looked at me and he said, yes, sir. No, I'm just kidding. He didn't say that at all. He started crying, he started bawling. He told me it was the worst day ever. It was just this horrible meltdown. But was the meltdown really about the tractor? No. He had plenty of opportunity to use the tractor, chose not to. The meltdown was because somebody else was about to have something that he didn't. And see, Jesus gets to the heart of human nature that you and I, just like when we were kids, have the same struggle as adults. Have you ever heard this phrase before? You heard somebody say, money is the root of all kinds of evil, or money is the root of all evil. People quote that like it's in scripture, and it's very close to what's in scripture, but that itself is not in scripture. 1 Timothy 6.10 says this, this is the actual scripture, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. Here's what Jesus knew and he taught over and over and over again. Here's what Paul knew when he was writing to Timothy, that the love of money can consume our lives in such a way that it distracts away, detracts away from the most important things in life. That money itself is not bad, it's a good thing. But the love of money, the pursuit of money, where that becomes the God in your life will wreck and destroy your life. And here's the real challenge that we live in a culture where it is the race, it is the thing, it is the idol that culture holds up and it's hard to fight against that. There's a, a, a recent thing that's come out called Chat GPT. Anybody heard of Chat GPT? All right, so some of us. So Chat GPT is a chat bot. For about the last 15 years, they've been developing chat bots. So probably if you go to a website and there's that little so section on the website that says, hey, would you like to chat with somebody? And if you jump in that chat and start chatting back and forth with somebody, most likely that's not a real human. Most likely that's a computer program that has been designed to respond to your questions with the answer that most likely fits that question. Now, slowly they've been making them smarter and smarter and smarter and smarter until chat GPT came out. And to say that it's a chat bot is really, it's, it's not a full understanding and comprehension of what it is. It's an artificial intelligence that looks at the internet, specifically research and periodicals, in order to give you an articulate answer to anything that you might ask it. Now, if you're like me, you start hearing that and you're like, did, did we learn nothing from the movies? This sounds a whole lot like Skynet. And as a complete side note, uh, ChatGPT right now, part of the reason it's kind of become a public thing is because uh, college kids will put a question for a research paper into ChatGPT and it'll write the entire research paper. Like it's, it's that, it's that smart and intelligent. And so colleges are trying to figure out, hey, what do we do? And I, I, I I'm, it, boggles my mind because I, when I was in high school, we didn't even have the internet. And so it was so much harder to do things in school back in the day. Now, now there's computer programs that will write your whole research paper for you. But it, here is what I was learning it this week and chatting with it this week. And I asked it a question about money in our culture in the United States of America. I also asked it to write this whole sermon. So you're welcome. <laughs> But, but I asked it about consumer habits and money in the United States of America, and it gave a long answer. But here's a paragraph from an artificial intelligence that understands American culture better than we do. Hey, here's what the AI said. Overall, consumer culture in the U.S. encourages people to constantly consume and acquire new products, which can lead to feelings of inadequacy and dissatisfaction with one's own possessions and financial status, despite having a high standard of living compared to most of the world. It's an AI. It's an AI looking at you and looking at me and saying, hey, here's, here's what happens in American culture. 
probably right now, if you gave me your phone, probably you've got some open tabs on your phone of things that you want. And if you don't have the tab open right now, if I look back at your recent history, there are probably some things that you've been looking up that you'd love to have. Maybe it's on Zillow, maybe it's on the Realtor app, maybe it's currently sitting in your Amazon shopping cart right now. Because we live in a culture that is obsessed with stuff. And here's the lie of culture. The lie is that if you will just get that one more shiny thing, then you'll be happy, then you'll be satisfied, then you'll be great. And you get that one more shiny thing, but there's somebody else and their stuff is shinier and their stuff is bigger and their stuff is badder. And you think until I get that, I'm not gonna be happy. You see it play out. Like a week ago when the lottery got up to $1.35 billion. And you have this thing that happens where people start talking about what they would do if they got a billion dollars. And people say, and by the way, I don't advocate gambling, but, but there is some part where people are like, well, I mean, if God wants me to win, I need to buy at least one ticket, right? It's just $2, that's not gambling. That's, that's giving God an opportunity to bless me with a billion. <laughs> and, and we talk ourselves into what we would do with it. Uh, people say, God, if, if you let me win the billion dollars, then I'm gonna give. I'm gonna give so much money away. I'll tithe 10% to the church. I'm gonna have never tithed ever before in my entire life. But once I have a billion, I'll have enough to tithe. And then, then you get a little desperate, you say, hey, I'll tithe, I'll tithe half of it. I'll give more than tithe. I'll give you 150 million, maybe 250. I'll give you 400 billion if you'll just let me win and I can have the rest. Now we know every study about people that win huge amounts of money is bad. Like their life goes off the railroad tracks. They hit a wall and crash. Uh, their relationships are destroyed. They end up with addiction. I mean, every, every, every case study is bad, 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 bad. But we always think, yeah, but I would be different. I could handle it. I could do it. If you look at all of Jesus' teaching on money, here's what really sums it up. Jesus says this, he calls us to live a financial life of sacrifice and generosity. Sacrifice and generosity. People ask, well, how much am I supposed to give? So in the Old Testament, you have the tithe. And a lot of times people argue, well, Jesus never talks about the tithe in the New Testament. The tithe is really from the Old Testament, so we shouldn't do that anymore. And, and I can agree with that argument if the argument is to give more than a tithe. But often people are arguing that in order to give less. And that's not Jesus teaching about money at all. Jesus teaching about money is to give. Uh, there's a few different uh, scenarios that you see inside Jesus teaching. And people say, well, how much am I supposed to give? Jesus doesn't give the answer. To the rich young ruler, he tells him what? You gotta give everything. So all of your possessions and follow me. And, and then to Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus changes his life, follows Jesus. And it says that he sold half of his possessions to follow after Jesus. And Jesus applauded him for it. Uh, then you have Barnabas in Acts that he chooses to follow after Jesus. He goes and he sells a field. And so there's not some prescription that says this is the exact amount that you're supposed to give. But in every scenario, they give until it hurts. And that's hard in our culture to do. Sometimes when I'm at the grocery store with one of my kids, we'll get up to the cash register and they'll see the candy bars and they'll ask for a candy bar. Now, most of the time we say ahead of time, hey, you're not getting anything. There's no candy, not gonna happen. But sometimes when it's just dad and the kid, you wanna be cool dad and fun dad, you know what I'm talking about? And my wife's right there in the front row. I'm sure she does it sometimes too. And it's occasional, I'll be like, hey, you pick whatever you want. You want a candy bar, you get it. Let's be fun dad. And so they'll look and they'll find some candy bar. And in their mind, this is this amazing gift. But in my mind, it's really not that great of a gift because it costs a buck, two bucks now because of inflation. Maybe if I got them a carton of eggs, that would be a real gift. But, <laughs> but, but here's the thing about buying my kid a candy bar. It doesn't cost me anything. Like my life is not affected. The $2 I spend on a candy bar in no way, shape or form. I'm not going home at night being like, oh man, I overspent on that candy bar. I'm stressing out. It's a fun gift. It's a good gift, but it by no means is a sacrificial gift. 
What Jesus is saying is that if you are gonna follow after him, if you're gonna pursue his kingdom, he's saying give sacrificially. What does that mean? That you give until it hurts. You give until it affects your lifestyle. You give until you don't have as much stuff as you could have, and you're sacrificing something that could have been great. Not because that thing is evil, but because if you want to know that God owns your heart, the way that you wrestle your heart away from money and stuff in this world is by living with open hands and giving things away. John Piper, the way that he describes it, is he says that you can either live for accumulation or you can live for simplification. The way that Andy Stanley describes it, is he says that you're either gonna live for stories or for stuff. That instead of living for more and more and more stuff, give your money away and create stories for the kingdom of God. Ultimately, it comes down to stewardship. That sometimes my kids will fight over cereal, especially if something like Lucky Charms is down to the very end. And they'll say, no, that's mine. I want more of that. You're having too much. You've got to share. That's my marshmallow. And occasionally I'll step in and I'll be like, guys, none of this is yours. You don't own a dadgum thing. This whole box, it's mine. Every one of your marshmallows, they are mine. Your life is only here by the goodness and the grace of me. So stop fighting over the marshmallows. That's what I wanna say. I, I don't actually do that. But in the back of my mind, that's what I'm thinking. And, and can I just say that the same thing is true with God? That the idea of stewardship is that everything I own is not mine. It's God's that he is allowing me to have it. And the purpose of my wealth, the purpose of your wealth, if you are a Christian and a follower after Jesus, is to use your wealth to advance the kingdom of God. And if you're not doing that, if I'm not doing that, then I have to ask the question, what really is the God of my life? John D. Rockefeller, one of the richest people in human history, lived in America a couple hundred years ago at one point, very famous question. They asked him, how much money does it take to make a man happy? And his answer was just one more dollar. He had a few different answers, but it was always just a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. John Rockefeller at one point at his peak, his income was the equivalent of 1.5% of the gross domestic product of the United States of America. And today's dollars, that would be $400 billion. Annual income more money than anyone can ever fathom spending. And he said, just a little bit more will make me happy. You see, Jesus knew that never will you have enough money to be happy. And so he's, he's giving this different lifestyle and he's saying, instead, hey, live different, live with open hands. The question is, what would happen if the capital C church, what would happen if we really lived in such a way that demonstrated that our life didn't look the exact same as the world, but we happened to go to church on Sunday morning. No, we said, hey, money, man, it's not the God of my life, so I'm free to give it away. That we looked at our life, instead of th thinking about the things that we don't have, we realized all that God has given us and we live accordingly. What could happen if we lived that way? John Wesley, his phrase that he lived by in his life was, make as much money as you can, Save as much money as you can and give away as much money as you can. He, he set a standard where he said he was never gonna live on more than 30 pounds a year. First year he made 28 pounds and so he gave away two pounds. The next year his income doubled, he made 60 pounds. He continued to live on the 28 pounds. He gave away 32. The next year it doubled again. He was making 90 pounds at one point. He was still living off of 30 pounds. What if... The church lived in such a way that said, hey, I don't need more stuff. As a steward of God, I'm gonna use all I have for the kingdom of God. What could happen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, I know that money is a difficult topic, a challenging topic, and yet it's such an important topic because we live in a culture that is so easy to get caught up in stuff and more and more and more and more. It's what we think about at night. It's what we daydream about during the day. Lord, what if we could hunger and thirst for you the same way we hunger and thirst for stuff? What if we could pursue you in the same way that the world around us pursues money? God, help us each to reflect in our hearts to know whether or not money 
the love of money is the God of our life or if you are the God of our lives. Help us to live with open hands, knowing that you have given us the abundance to bless the world around us, but only if we are willing to live with a kingdom mindset. Help us, O Lord, is our prayer. In Jesus' name.